Welcome to Polycast, an official podcast of a Bolton civilization site. Daniel Quick. Makalua. Imran Siddiqui. Hey, Madeline. With guest co-hosts. Carta Mandua. Alexander I. I'm your host, Alexander I. And I'm here with Dan Q, Makalua, Carta Mandua, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Here's an interesting poll. Which leader has the best facial hair in Beyond the Sword? Because, of course, vanilla of foreign warlords don't count. <laughs> no, I just mean in Beyond the Sword, all inclusive, very well. Apparently, Gilgamesh is kicking some serious. <laughs> His braided Sumerian beard. This was actually one of the things that I kind of advocated for Beyond the Sword. Why do all of these leaders in Vanilla have clean-shaven faces? It should be hairy, scruffy people. They have good barbers? Did you ever think of that? Uh, I don't know about Gilgamesh having a good barber. It looks yeah. like they just put a bunch of braids in there. <laughs> but my vote definitely goes to Charlemagne. I have not had him pop up in a game yet. Really? Oh. Wow. Huh. But if you look at this list, a lot of these characters are added in Beyond the Sword. Charlemagne and Darius, Gilgamesh, Hammurabi. Well, that was a big Mesopotamian blurb there. Joam of Portugal, de Gaulle, Pericles, Suleiman, William of Orange. I don't know why Ramses is in this poll, though. Really was clean-shaven. No, but he has the neat fake beard with the gold and stuff. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah I, that doesn't really count. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a bling beard. <laughs> I like the entry for Napoleon. <laughs> Five o'clock shadow. Who does your vote go to? I think I'm going to go with Brennus. Mm, nice. Celts were famous for their whiskers, especially their big mustaches. I know the person who started this. Ottoman D actually combines Brennus and Ragnar together because they have a full beard. Boo! That's not the same thing. I don't know if you've I... ever seen the famous statue of Vercingetorix. It's somewhere in France. He's got a heck of a honker of a mustache. That thing's huge. That thing can conquer countries. <laughs> it goes on its own rampage and then it credits it all to him. I'm a little concerned about Catan Settler's response, however. I refuse to vote until Boudicca is on the list. <laughs> That's like the other guy. They wanted Victoria to be on the list. They I, wax. I can see Victoria a little more than Boudicca. <laughs> I say that I win the best facial hair award. <laughs> oh. Well, you're not in Beyond the Sword, so... Yes, I am. <laughs> Are you the reincarnation of someone? Is that what you're getting at here? No, just play the Babylonians and build a settler. They modeled that after you? Wow. That's right. They sure did. I was on the uh, ethnically diverse units mod, so I'm doing all the historical research for how they're going to design the units. Hmm. My avatar would be a great basis for the Babylonian settler. But you don't look like that in real life, right? No, but my avatar does. And he has a beard, and I have a beard. <laughs> Avatars at all that can on the internet. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> this week of the news, we talked about EA trying to buy Take Two, and Take Two saying, "Haha, no." We also talked about Soren Johnson talking about the making of Civilization Four. Forum talk this week, we look at a greater use for artillery, especially defensively. <laughs> <laughs> Stealth Destroyer, Upgrade or Downgrade, and Castle Obsolescence. In the research lab, we talked about civilization-specific events. Hail Senator. In the Senate today, we discussed whether it is necessary to improve every single tile, and whether raising makes the game too easy. Here's what's been making news in the Civ community. In the news, EA says they'll probably buy Take-Two, but Take-Two says maybe later. Apparently, uh, Take-Two said that EA had underestimated their worth, their net value of ideas and, and people. So it's probably good that they're holding off on the merger for now. That and EA has a reputation for problems every now and then. Totally screwing up anything he buys? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I can't blame Take-Two for saying no right now because they've got GTA coming out in just a couple of months. And EA's just trying to snipe and bid them before they have that on the market just so they could get the profit. Absolutely. And they'll screw it up. 
and Take Two knows that and doesn't want to lose their reputation. And I don't want Civ in the hands of EA either. Yeah, it's it's a uh, very scary idea. But they've done so well with Smack in their portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> Not. <laughs> If done so well equals totally ignored it and pretend it never existed, well then, yeah. And poor Sid Meier getting all those questions. When are you going to do Smack 2, Sid? Um, I can't. <laughs> exactly. Well, now hang on. They could just name it Centauri Alpha. <laughs> <laughs> Take 2 is annoyed that this offer came on the heels of the release of Grand Theft Auto 4. I like that. Uh, looking to release this on the 29th of April, so please talk to us on the 30th of April. We'll be interested. <laughs> <laughs> Electronic Arts CEO John Riccatello says that we delayed until we were certain we weren't screwing with GTA. Uh. Hmm. <laughs> right. Oh, really? We waited until we were sure it had gone gold, is what he means. <laughs> now there's an idea. John Riccatello's Alpha Centauri. <laughs> that would be popular. Oh, yes. He's got a lot of name recognition out there. Popular for target practice? <laughs> you know who else is popular? Jack Thompson. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Leave him out of this. This is a family show. <laughs> <laughs> no, if EA took over, it'd be John Madden's Civilization V. <laughs> oh, no. John Madden's oh. Civilization V 2008. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, I can totally see where that would go. Uh, 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 the, the Vikings are are, 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 are building, building some Vikings so they can, uh, they can steal a city. <laughs> Pardon the bad impression. No, that's actually pretty close. <laughs> EA have shrugged off the talk of corporate culture issues hampering the effectiveness of the potential combined company saying that the cultural differences between EA and Take-Two were no greater than among EA's existing studios. Uh, uh, <laughs> let's look at the diversity of studios EA has bought over the years and think about that again. <laughs> yeah, they've got a reputation now as the juggernaut that devours gaming companies and never does anything with them. Give us back origin, dang it. <laughs> as one user on GameSpot, where all these articles have come from that we're citing, MJS Woosh says that he is interested in innovation and not quote-unquote sequel factories. Indeed. Indeed. Very much. Yeah, if you're going to make a sequel for anything, it needs to be a good title in its own right. You know, if you're just going to regurgitate. That's what they did with Battle for Middle-Earth. Like, let's add some new units. It's barely good enough to be an expansion, but let's call it a sequel. Yeah, and if this was a real serious proposal and not just a, a bullish move, they would have offered more than 64% premium on uh, Take-Two's most recent stock value. Yeah. Yeah, because Take-Two has a lot of other lucrative franchises, not just GTA. I know it sounds like a great deal to EA, but I very much understand Take-Two going, <laughs> no. Listen, EA, we know you're down and out about Take-Two essentially saying no right now, playing coy, playing hard to get, but you could sponsor this show for $2 billion. We won't even think about it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> we can do radio ads for them. Also, we've got the uh, making of Civ Four by Soren Johnson. Soren's awesome. He's like Sid Jr. He's definitely an asset for any game developers to have on their team. And, you know, I'm looking at Spore right now just because he's on the project. No, it's not just you. I mean, I know Real Right does a lot of interesting things, but I looked at Spore for and I'm like, well, hmm, I don't know. And then, oh, wait, Soren's on it? Oh, well, maybe I'll look at it again, <laughs> you know? And he has many, many more years of making fun games in front of him. That's the best part. Totally. And as a tie-in, what sports publisher to be... Oh, no. <laughs> Don't bring them up in a perfectly civil conversation. <gasps> civil? Oh. <laughs> Good pun. Unintentional, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, in this article, Soren talks about, as uh, Rock Paper Shogun puts it, the genesis of Civ Four, And I uh, like Soren's comment about Civ Three which was a cool and crazy project which blew up halfway through. <laughs> yep. That sounds right. And I think most of Apollyton and Sif fanatics would agree with that. I'll agree with that. Yeah, why don't you share your opinion of Sif 3? I hate Sif 3. <laughs> <laughs> it started out neat, and then it all went downhill. They isolated four things that they wanted to change, and they also sort of wanted a, uh, a longer development cycle, two and a half years, as opposed to one and a half years with Civ 3. 
And of course, not having things that blow halfway through, even if it was two and a half years or five years, would also help. Wanted to improve on accessibility. And I like the point that Civ for a long time had its own gaming conventions and a lot of strategy games share, and you shouldn't have to relearn an interface every single time you play the game. It's true. I mean, there's going to be some relearning, of course, but it always seemed very counterintuitive. As much as we can like buttons, hope. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was one of the reasons why Civ 4 was so popular was because the uh, interface was streamlined. Somebody could just come in and start playing and never have to worry about a learning curve, or at least a very small learning curve, those who weren't uh, already uh, fanatics for Civ. Yeah, all five of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't a fanatic of Civ when I started. It wasn't until Civ 4 came out that I even would play it, so... So the second point was going to 3D. Civ allowed a lot more variety than before. But he says they didn't really think about the implications of making a strategy game in 3D because, of course, people are just right away trying to think, how big can I make this? And in a 2D game, he says, in a sense, you can be as big as you want. The real challenge with the 3D was making it scalable and wonders if what would have happened if they'd stayed on the 2D train for Civ 4. But he's glad that they didn't, you know, they were tackling new territory. They weren't repeating themselves. They learned things along the way and there were trade-offs. Which is good. That's why it was Civilization 4 and not Civilization 3, 2. <laughs> Civilization 3.5. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Third point was multiplayer. Something I liked reading about is how they went, basically when you're playing the single player game, you're playing a multiplayer game with just one person. The multiplayer code is the game code. There's no difference between the two, basically, which makes it a lot more accessible for everybody who does want to play MP. And making it much simpler if I can use that term, in terms of the development phase, by focusing on multiplayer first. Yeah, they didn't have to come in at the end and try and hack it in. It was there from the beginning. More developers need to think of that. And then the fourth point was modability, which is probably something better discussed on another show that we do. But still, <laughs> <laughs> to say that it's um, mod-friendly is very true. Some people say, well, it's a little more complex than they would have liked because of how deep it's able to go more depth as opposed to breadth. But if they hadn't made it so deep, here in another year, they'd start complaining because it's not deep enough. <laughs> Explored all the shallow stuff it could do. And they're like, you should have made this deeper. Because then they wouldn't have anything else to do while they're waiting for Civ Five. Yeah, you always get those uh, obsessive players. Like, There's not enough of Nicomachean ethics in this game. Where, where's the ethics? You know, <laughs> it's these little too deep for most players, I'm sorry to say. There was one point by uh, one person where they actually disagreed with something Soren said. Oh my gosh. Oh, what? Heresy. <laughs> <laughs> the part where Soren says, because for some reason the strategy genre has not been nearly as mod friendly as a lot of other games that have appeared on the PC, it's not in strategy game developers' DNA. Lady Cesare said, I'm not sure about that point because Call to Power 2 was very moddable and Dominion is one of the easiest moddable games out there. Now, I haven't heard of Domin sorry, Dominions. Yes, Call to Power 2 is very moddable from what I understand. The two Age of Empires games, well, the first one wasn't very moddable. The second one, you could actually go into the editor that came with the game and play around with it some. So it's not entirely not in strategy games DNA, but it is uncommon at least. Or if, if you can mod on those other games like that, it's not for noobs to try. <laughs> like me. The start of the Civ 4 BTS Team Democracy game is growing ever closer. General game setting and rule discussions are ongoing as of this recording. A half dozen teams with over 50 members are set to enter the fray already. For more on the Tri-League and Team DG, log on to apolden.net slash forums. Got news? Email news at apolton.net or send a private message to Dan Q, Locutus, or one of the other news editors. This is Forum Talk, where we investigate hot civ issues in the forums. I guess this is a suggestion from Apocalypse to discuss artillery, more use for it, especially defensively, is the quote. Now, that's a little bit of a difficult thing for me to discuss, because for me, there's only one use for artillery. Getting rid of other cities, city defense? Exactly, exactly. Bombarding the city. Same here. I use it for intimidation. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it works so well with the AI. 
Do I detect a little hint of sarcasm? <laughs> nope. <laughs> Monazuma is very persuadable. Yeah, he's the sort of character you can really reason with. If by reason you mean build a big stack of doom, park it on his border, and go, don't even think about it. Yeah. <laughs> Hit it right on the head. But when that stack of doom is in your borders or from his side, actually the artillery does have a defensive use because you can sit there and bring a stack down. I forget what the cap is on the collateral damage. I think it's something like 50%. But you can greatly weaken a stack with a bunch of artillery or other type of siege weapon units like that and then use your own units to start taking out the stack before it attacks you. Right. But this, of course, also assumes that you were prepared for the stack to be coming in anyway. <laughs> Which, if it is Montezuma, most likely you were not prepared for it. Because <laughs> it just happens randomly. And your defense minister summary right now would be, oh crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Him and Isabella. Mm, yeah, she's a little iffy herself. <laughs> she gets on her PMS moments, you're like, whoa, stand back. <laughs> Reload, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> You know, I think one of the problems that Artillery has had in the Civ series is that in each game it's had kind of a different function or a different things that it gets good for. And so with each new Civ game you have to get used to the new role that Artillery is going to play. And I mean by Artillery I also mean like the medieval siege weapons and all of those items. At least as far as uh, it seemed to me, in Civilization Four, Artillery functioned differently than it did in Civilization Three. And Civilization Two. Yeah, I definitely find more use for Artillery now in Civ Four than Civ Two. I definitely find much more use for artillery offensively, and I think artillery's role as offensive unit is very well defined. So just leave it alone. <laughs> yeah, and I think you could assume that when you uh, fortify a city, there's already you know, artillery emplacements there with the garrison. You know, the thing that you can't see that's just in my head. Yeah, that percentage number at the bottom of the city there, that's your cannons and what have you. Absolutely. It's good for an active defense, though. The offensive defense. Yes. Also interesting is the defensive offense. Oh, yes. Start a war, let them get killed on your territory, because it kicks up their war weariness faster. Exactly. And now on defensive defense, we'll... Wait. <laughs> defensive defense. <laughs> What's that? Stock your city full of units and pray? <laughs> Stealth destroyers. Does anybody use them? <laughs> I guess that's the point of that topic. <laughs> Let's see, number of times I've gotten that far lately. Um, none? <laughs> <laughs> oh good, I'm not the only one! <laughs> I keep getting to the Middle Ages and ticking somebody off who has stacks of doom. <laughs> <laughs> Her name is usually Isabella, or Montezuma. <laughs> Her name, eh? Oh, hey, what's going on there? <laughs> You know what I mean. <laughs> I think the key is to use them defensively. <laughs> yeah, I actually have one game ongoing right now. I actually very rarely build destroyers because I'm not usually building up my navy that much until the time that stealth destroyers become available. If you're not playing Beyond the Sword, then this conversation may mean absolutely nothing to you, except that you should buy Beyond the Sword right now from a pult, and so you'll understand what we're talking about. Here, here. <laughs> you should have bought Beyond the Sword yesterday. <laughs> For stealth destroyers, I do use them, but I agree with the thread starter here and Barclay that uh, both stealth destroyer and destroyer should exist simultaneously, that you can build one or the other or a combination of both because they both have their strengths and weaknesses and losing the destroyer of the eight things that M. Barclay cites... The one that the big for me, which is uh, spotting submarines, things that destroyers can do, but stealth destroyers can't. Certainly, as some people said, if they have destroyers already, I wouldn't be upgrading the stealth destroyers. I would build them new. He says, in the real world, I would expect stealth destroyers to be able to operate in an unstealthy way and do all of the jobs that conventional destroyers can. Now, at the same time, I don't think there's any point then in having a stealth destroyer and destroyer being able to do the exact same things, because game mechanic-wise, that's crazy, and we've talked before about gameplay versus realism. Yeah, I was actually one of the beta testers for Beyond the Sword, and I remember thinking, wow, there's so many cool new units that they've added. But I don't remember ever thinking that about the stealth destroyer. In fact, <laughs> uh, until I saw this thread, I had utterly forgotten that it was even in the game. By the time I get all the way down the tech tree to stealth, I'm usually using stealth bombers and then conventional destroyers and battleships to escort my transports. And there's so little time left in the game at that point. 
I have time to build stealth destroyers. Like Ann Barclay is saying, I don't think you really want to convert the destroyers you've got because they have a perfectly good function with your fleets. So it's a nice idea, but eh, maybe too much. Well, and the way I play, my Navy, really, its function is just to defend all of the transports that are carrying my overwhelming military land power across the oceans. So why am I going to bother upgrading to stealth destroyers if I just have these defensive task forces to keep the transports from getting sunk? Yeah, I'll usually tuck in a carrier with a stack of transports that has a couple of fighters doing air patrol while they're going. So if a fighter comes along, he's going to have to get through the fighter screen anyway. Yeah. And if you're talking about them trying to come to your land cities, you've usually got a fighter squad up as a defense, so... Or two or three or ten. Yeah, exactly. Why do we need stealth destroyers again? (laughs) So, as far as greater use for stealth destroyers, there is none. (laughs) I think the solution is being able to have both stealth destroyers and destroyers in the game at the same time. So you can have a choice. I agree. I think that's a fine option. He's saying that the coastal bombardment, pillaging enemy aquatic resources, and blockading is where stealth destroyers really shine. Talks about how as long as stealth destroyers are in stacks by themselves, they can provide a way to bombard, pillage, or blockade along the coast of a less advanced enemy. But if stealth destroyers are mixed with other types of ships, the presence of the stealth destroyers does not stop the enemy from doing nasty things to the other ships. Yes, but that's what we use submarines for. Apparently the stealth destroyer is a submarine above the water. (laughs) <laughs> submarines, for example, I love the addition of the TAC submarine over the regular submarine, but this uh, stealth destroyer over the destroyer? Boo! <laughs> and my favorite function of submarines is carrying the intercontinental ballistic missiles you know, over to my enemy's territory so that I can explode their home port so there's no place for their stealth destroyers to land. <laughs> so I guess the AIs are the only ones that will be building stealth destroyers. On purpose. <laughs> <laughs> On purpose, yeah. There we go. <laughs> Well, we've got several discussions on the obsolescence of castles, what to do with them. You know, this one person here on Sith Fanatics says, The big problem with the castle, of course, is its timing. It has a short, effective lifespan. You can't build it until engineering, and then it goes obsolete with economics. Those techs are usually not too far apart. To add insult to injury, by the time you get some castles built, a lot of the AI Siths will be picking up banking and switching to mercantilism, drastically reducing the value of your trade routes. And I would agree that the castle's lifespan is really too short. Personally, as a medieval aficionado, I want a good thousand years where I can just go medieval on the game. <laughs> it, seems like, <laughs> it seems like we're rushed from ancient times to modern times, and, oh yeah, there's like this medieval stuff that you could maybe build if you really want to, but you might as well you know, just wait because a lot better stuff is coming in a couple of years. Yeah, castles get overlooked a lot by uh, a lot of players just because, oh yeah, I picked up this tech, I can build my castles, oh yeah, I just researched this technology that's obsoleted them, just like that. yeah it needs to be further down somewhere uh, maybe with gunpowder or something which is really what did obsolete castles yes just a cannon can really blow a hole through a castle (laughs) but hey when you're still fighting with pointy sticks and stones but usually if i've got stone hooked up i end up building castles because at that point in my larger cities they only take a couple of turns it's like plump castle Mm mm-hmm Although they would actually be more useful on my borders, but you know. Yeah, when I build a castle, I want it to feel like I'm building this massive stone edifice to keep out all invaders. You know, not, oh yeah, it was just something else I threw up. (laughs) 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 I really do agree that they should go obsolete with gunpowder. I mean, my wife and I were touring England two years ago. You know, we were at Pevensey on the uh, South Sussex coast. And it's just this ruin that's full of holes where it's been just blown apart by cannons. That's what obsoletes castles. Not because you've magically discovered how to better make shiny things. Exactly. (laughs) Oh no, shiny things. I can't build castles anymore. (laughs) Going obsolete with economics, the thread starter for this first one. For your... The scientist post Waldo. (laughs) (laughs) Talking about that, the only reason you might want to go to economics is if you can get, is a great merchant, because a great frigate merchant is better than a a trade roads, but there's no compelling reason to make economics a priority. Well, economics is, along with constitution, required for corporations, which then leads to assembly line with steam power and your infantry, and which in part leads to industrialization with your tanks and whatnot. So I'm going to economics for other reasons, 
as much as I really don't want it to see castles become obsolete, some people were saying that either castles should become either obsolete later and or able to build them earlier. I much prefer the idea that it's going to be obsolete later, as you were saying with Result of Gunpowder bonus. For Beyond the Sword, I very rarely built castles. Now, I would build walls. Now I'm building walls to be able to get to the castle. I want to be able to use castles as much as I possibly can. As Uncle JJ says, uh, defensive purposes is in uh, border areas, and a castle gives you a plus 25% defense against bombardment on top of the 50% from the wall. And while it is a very short period of time, the fact that you also get plus 25% spy points during that time, and it could be a plus 50% if you're also running nationalism at the same time, something that can't be ignored. So I'm not going to not build them just because of its short time frame. I just want to be able to have reason to build more of them and be able to have more of my cities build them before they become obsolete. Really, I'd like to see from the years, I don't know, 700 to about 15 or 1600, I want to have to build castles to protect against the raging Viking and Mongol hordes, you know, or whichever aggressive player you've got in the game. You know, I want the castle to be the thing that saves me, not something that I just kind of either build because it's got some great functions or neglect because, oh, I already got economics. I think you're letting your love of history rule your strategy. That's why I played Civ in the first place. <laughs> I just remember the other reason people go for economics a lot, because it's on the route to liberalism, which is a free tech. Yes, there you go. There's another reason why you don't want to delay economics, even for the benefits the castles give you. The Apolitonians have discovered economics. Now they can charge you for Poly+. Plus. <laughs> <laughs> Come on into the research lab where we explore concepts that are not in Civ yet, but might be in the future. Shall we move on to civilization-specific events? Why not? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Enthusiasm! <laughs> I'll try to read this quote in a loud, clear, and enthusiastic voice. During the Toxcatl feast, the young man who is Texcatlipoca's likeness has escaped from the Teocalli in Tenochtitlan before he could be sacrificed. Cool. Oh my. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> and he pronounced it all right, too. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a really cool idea, to have civilization-specific events. I haven't really seen a lot of them. I'm assuming that these are just Aztec-specific that uh, he's describing here. It will really just would add a lot of flavor to the game to have whatever event pops up be in the same theme as the Civ you're playing. The Japanese could have a ritualistic warrior code honor event. The Greeks could have a philosopher problem like Socrates' uh, execution. Or Charlemagne could dump some forced conversions on his neighboring cities. You know, just a good flavor thing. Yeah, and apparently other than this uh, Aztec random event, someone cite something to do with an American voting scandal. No, I think I saw somewhere on this thread that these were some of Solver's events, and I'm not sure, I mean, if, if that's accurate or not, but it sounds like it would be, because I know Solver is an Aztec aficionado, and it, it would make sense for him to make Aztec-specific events. Yes, the American one is a Solver event. The results from that are, it says, plus six angry faces to end plus one happy face for ten turns in all cities. Or courthouses and capital gain plus two production, and the city has two turns of revolt. So I'll bet this Aztec one is, yes it is. <laughs> it also looks like there are some other civilization-specific events in Solver's events as well. One here is when you are the French, anti-monarchists. Mm. So you're French and are running the hereditary rule, Civic, where the events are either plus three happy from uh, palace or plus two gold from all cathedrals. So you can also read up on a, a dissident priest if you are Egyptian. Well, I'm looking forward in future to seeing some Babylonian-specific events. You know me. <laughs> like the greatest supporter of the Babylonian returning to Civ. Yep. <laughs> I've had that avatar for a long time. The Egyptians did have one where Cleopatra runs off with Mark Antony and your country goes into anarchy for three turns or something. Ooh, <laughs> that would be cool. Interesting. 
Rome goes into anarchy for three turns as well. Yes. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> or if it occurred later on in the game, oh, your civilization is now broadcasting the first soap operas in the world. Congratulations. <laughs> 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 well, you know how that you get options that you can unlock when you get a later tech? Like with the um, Great Artist event, and uh, there's a third option once you have, I think it's radio or something like that, broadcast a hit single? Oh, yes, the recording contract, yep. So the Cleopatra Mark Antony event happens in the modern times, becomes a hit movie. Uh, major or, motion picture yeah. event. Or a made-for-TV movie, even. <laughs> hey, wait. The Cleopatra story. And then I think you should get minus two workers because they're watching TV. (laughs) (laughs) Great idea. Desperate Queens of the Nile. (laughs) Cleopatra. Welcome to the Senate, where we discuss game strategy. Is it necessary to improve every tile? Platinum Onyx wants to know. If you know a city doesn't have enough food to achieve its max pop, why bother? Although I must say, Platinum, I think you should bother and edit your opening post so that it does say doesn't have enough, as you were called on later. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's only a little confusing. (laughs) I mean, I've got plenty of food already. Why should I harvest it? (laughs) Generally speaking, for me, as far as improving every tile... I will eventually improve every tile within my city radius. But if, for example, there's a strategic source within my culture border, but it's outside the city radius, I'm definitely going to improve that first. And without a question, uh, along your borders, as they become a little more established, having roads and eventually railroads along there, it's prioritizing. And if I'm really bored later on, maybe I'll drop a worker in uh, the Arctic and just start building roads. (laughs) I'm really bored. Well, there's that long period in between roads and railroads where if your empire is small enough, you've probably improved everything that you need to improve. So you can just sit there and start building random roads or forts over here. And, <laughs> and then, of course, after you finish all your railroads and hook up all your modern resources, then you can start building the Transarctic Railroad. <laughs> Those are always <laughs> fun. <laughs> oh, or you can have your units pillage your own improvements. <laughs> Oops, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> Let's build that again. <laughs> Well, you know, if I ever automate my workers, eventually every tile is going to have something on it. It's usually not what I would have built there were I doing it all manually. (laughs) Oh, gosh. Yes, which is why when I automate my workers, they only improve my trade network. I do not (laughs) let them do anything else automatically. Yeah. Yeah, the first thing I tick off is do not chop the forests. (laughs) Oh, you've got aluminum and oil and uranium all within the same big X? Well, I know exactly what to build on these spaces. Forest preserves. <laughs> <laughs> the comment by Radis Du when he mentions, like, even if you have a smaller city and you know you're not going to be able to work all of the tiles at once, you can change the combinations to suit your immediate tactics. I think as someone else said in the thread, sometimes it's actually beneficial to uh, have your city starve. If, for example, you've got lots of unhappy people and... <laughs> Oops, I wasn't watching my happy cap. I don't know how I took those people off those fields. Dee, 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 dee. I can just see the domestic advisor. Your Majesty, haven't you been getting my memos? Uh, no. Well, the first memo said the peasants were revolting. And the second memo asked you what you wanted to do about it. And the third memo said all of the revolting peasants starved to death. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> Now, one person here talks about that your population is going to max out just because of the available tiles. You could, for example, settle a great merchant in the town, but says that he would never do that. It's a, For a marginal town, it's a waste of a great merchant. He says the other much better way is to introduce Sid Sushi or General Mills if you're playing Beyond the Sword, of course. Which you should. Sid Sushi is awesome. And to all of you listening at home, as soon as you finish listening to this polycast, please return to your desktop and play Beyond the Sword. If you don't currently have Beyond the Sword... Go buy it. You know, that was almost well said there, Alexander, but you forgot to mention where they should buy it from. So, yeah. Are we offering it yet? (laughs) From our online store? (laughs) The special Apolytone edition of Beyond the Sword. Comes with uh, Dan Q and Mark G. Leaderheads. (laughs) And the pre-settler level. (laughs) And the pre-settler level. That's right. And the uh, unique unit of the (laughs) Polytubby. Hey, hey, you're also forgetting the banana unit. We have the banana unit. Oh, yeah. 
Because otherwise, this expansion pack would be invalid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's an alternate unique unit for the uh, Indian sieve. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Is this the part where you make fun of the people that aren't here? (laughs) (laughs) Noto asks, does raising make the game too easy? Saying, I know I can turn off city raising, maybe I'll do that, but then the problem is city raising makes sense in the ancient age, or perhaps raising should take some time, more than just one turn. If raising is turned off, early warfare will be more difficult, I like the idea that raising taking more than one turn, where it's a combination of how large the city is, what units you have, how many units you have. You don't want it to be too complicated that you need a calculator to figure it out. But (laughs) I think people that are analyzing this deeply into the game that they're playing in their free time is losing the fun out of the game. I just play and do whatever I think is fun at the time. I don't think you should be like, oh no! Was that bad? Did I make the game too easy for myself? Oh, for shame. Like, I can't start another one and do something different next time. (laughs) It's a game. It's what you do in your free time. The only times when I really raise a city, there's always the vendetta. If I'm Rome and I'm playing against Carthage and I really don't like them, I'm going to raise your capital. Yeah, heck yes, I am. Take this. Die, 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 Hannibal. You know, but uh, other than that, I mean, if, if a city's got really good culture... I'm going to want that for myself. When I raise an enemy city, it's usually because there's no use for it for me. If they built in a really stupid place, which the AI is wont to do, or if they built near a spot where I wanted to build. <laughs> you know, oh, there's you know five resources in this area. I want to build my city right there, and oh no, this moron just built right next to the spot I wanted to build. So, okay, I'm going to go to war and just raise your city because... Just because. But other than that and the uh, personal vendetta, I usually just hang on to their cities. Yeah, I'll hang on to them if they're properly placed or nicely placed. But if they're some little stupid city up in the tundra that's never going to grow past size two, well, then I don't need to deal with your maintenance. (laughs) Yeah. Like in a game I'm playing right now, I'm going to have to be visiting like right next to the spot you want. Well, Bodica just did that to me. She put two cities in the spot. I was going to put one city. I'll be paying her a visit later. Is it with Jaguars? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm all for the optimization of Civ that you can tailor it in a lot of respects to your specific tastes. You don't like vassals? Fine. If I don't like random events? Fine. You don't like goody huts? What's wrong with you? <laughs> fine. <laughs> but being able to turn off city raising, uh, I really don't like seeing that option there. The thing that I was glad to see changed in Civ Four is that you could take a city and then you could abandon the city later on. And I know that's kind of a side point, and I initially didn't like that idea, but for gameplay purposes, that was good. But again, being able to raise it instantaneously just in a turn, perhaps that is a little easy. Some people talk of that then that, well, then if you did that, then there should be some partisan units, perhaps, the probability of partisan units resisting quite successfully, at least for a little while, your attempts to do that. I like that idea as well. But then there are some suggestions here. For example, you have certain government civics and you shouldn't be allowed to raise. Or there should be some war weariness to reflect the unpopularity of massacring other people. No. Maybe if you had all of your civics set to politically correct, happy time democracy, love fest. (laughs) You know, I could see that happening. Post Beyond the Sword, I wouldn't have agreed with GSFGF's suggestion, which is adding a UN resolution against raising, because now I just say never. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think that one would get voted in, because I think all the other civs would want to keep the option to raise, too. It's not like trying to push their extra trade routes or global currency, because that gets them all shiny stuff. There's a good way for competitive play to have other people give you advice. That's the Apulgian University. And we would find that where? Jeez. <laughs> uh, Apulgian.net slash forums? Really? Wow. How could I figure that out from Apulgian University? I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder. Call in today. In North America, the number is 301-637-7659. That's 301-637-POLY. 
In Europe, 44-121-288-7659. That's 44-121-288-POLY. You can Skype us at The Polycast or email us at polycast at apolton.net. For more information on Polycast, our sibling show Modcast, or about Polycast in general, log on to the series' official website at polycast.apolton.net. Why there aren't more women here? <sighs> Apparently, the reward center of men's brains are activated to a much greater extent than women's when they gain territory in a video game. What? <laughs> I totally object to that. <laughs> I totally object to that. That study is wrong. They had the wrong women in that. They sure do. Women are far more territorial than men. What are you talking about, people? <laughs> it's true. Wait, you can't build there. I was going to build there. I am totally taking over your civilization for that. It becomes personal. Yes. <laughs> that was my pig iron city, you fools. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the title of this article, which is Why Video Games Tickle Men More? Question um, mark. Let's not get off topic. <laughs> <laughs> But what is it? interesting, according to this 2007 Harris Interactive study, young males are two to three times more likely than females to feel addicted to video games. What way do we want to take that? First of all, how do you define young males? Why is it just females? Why are you not distinguishing some sort of age range between males and females? And does this mean that this is not the case for older men? Like, it's just the wording is very uh, odd. Either that or it could just be poor reporting. Oh, 11 young males and 11 young females. <laughs> that is a huge study. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah, that's a huge sample. Yeah, uh-huh. I can't believe they got so many people to do that one with for them. 22 people. That's more people than could comfortably perhaps sit in my house. Wow. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's freaking huge, man. That's the hardcore. I can't believe they got 11 young females to play numerous 24-second intervals of a game. <laughs> hey. <laughs> yeah, I think this study is completely invalid. Yeah, there's no bananas. <laughs> <laughs> yes, people who did this study, your s statistical sample is way too small. Try again. Well, totally. Nobody would take this seriously, this article. Nobody really in psychology or anything would look at this. Suddenly someone is quoted here, someone by the name of Reese, R-E-I-S-S, Yet the only person they talk about is that the new study led by someone named Robbins. They start quoting this Reese person, but no one, the article doesn't say who this Reese person is. <laughs> Am I supposed to know who he is, like Cher or something, and the one name is enough to know? But whoever this person says, this last paragraph, it doesn't take a genius to figure out why historically are the conquerors and tyrants of our species. They're the males. Um, uh, I don't think this person is very historically minded. <laughs> no. Thank you for listening to Polycast number 39. You've been listening to myself, Cardamandua, Dan Q, Alexander I, Amakalua. I think it's funny on that thread how Lancer asks Cardamandua if she dresses up to play Civ. <laughs> I do. I put on makeup and my fine jewelry and sit in my high heels at the computer. <laughs> uh -huh. Sure you do. No sarcasm there at all. <laughs> <laughs> Today in the research lab, we talked about civil... Oh, that wasn't good at all. <laughs> <laughs> Blooper! <laughs> all right, and much of that will be cut. <laughs> now that we've killed yet another topic. Just everything I say. <laughs> this week in the news, we talked about EA... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Close enough. <laughs> Yay, dang it. <laughs> You've been listening to myself, Cardamandua, also Dan Q, Makaluia, and I'm sorry, I screwed your name up. How do you. Everybody does. <laughs> I know the person who started this throw the this hole. I don't know where that word came from. E I E I. -I. <laughs> Sorry. Is that good? Yay! I like how this time you mentioned Macalua last. Sorry, I just <laughs> just in case I messed up, it'd be easier to edit out. <laughs> Smart thinking. <laughs> there you go. <laughs>
If you, if, 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 if. You've been listening to Polycast episode 39. Um, I don't like that. Can we start over? <laughs> Record date. March 1st, 2008. Sound clips copyright Civilization 4 and the Warlords and Beyond the Sword expansion packs. Copyright 2008, Apolitan Civilization Site at Apolitan.net.